Hi, everybody. This is Tony Kahn, the producer and director of Morning Stories from WGBH in Boston. From the time that he was nine years old, my older brother Jim wanted to be a doctor. At least that's what he said. I thought of him as a kind of explorer, leading the way in our boyhood adventures, always scouting out the terrain, ready to take the first blow. He still carries a scar down his leg from hidden barbed wire in a ravine that we were stomping through one day as kids that I feel was meant for me. When Jim did become a doctor, he stayed an explorer. For over 30 years, he tried out just about every kind of medicine there is, from the public health corps to running a hospital emergency ward, an alcohol detoxification unit, uh, serving as an infectious diseases specialist, hiring on as the traveling doc on an island off the shores of Massachusetts, running a private practice out of his own home, and uh, helping develop a new antibiotic for a drug company. When he retired a few months ago, I called him up to see how he was doing. And in the lull between his travels through medicine and whatever adventure comes up next for him, what kind of treasures he found along the way. We call today's morning story, My Brother the Doctor. I did keep a card file, a Rolodex of all my patients. And I, every now and then I just spin it and remember people. I used to spend a full hour with every patient. I never saw more than 8 or 12 patients a day. Go through a complete examination, head to toe, and then sit down and talk. And I began to realize, and it was gradual, my patients would almost never call over the weekend or at night. Guys would say, you know, you didn't have any problems when I covered you, Jim. Nobody called in. Or they said they'd wait to see you in the office Monday. Geez, I haven't thought about these um, these people in years. There was a man with a very severe muscular degenerative disease, totally dependent on his wife to help him get in and out of the car, in and out of chairs, totally dedicated to each other. And I just wanted to be there for this family. I just admired them tremendously. I was always glad to see them. Oh, there were many others. There were some very odd people who were constantly fighting with each other. For some reason, I just felt I ought to be part of that struggle. I don't know why. A couple, he was must have been 60, had a crew cut. It's as if he were trying to be a tough kid from his youth back in the 50s. His wife was this big, rosy-cheeked, New Hampshire, backwoods girl, always laughing, always pleasant twice his size. I don't know. I always looked forward when they were going to be in the office. And another of my neighbors, she had severe problems with alcohol abuse and smoking, depression, kids constantly in trouble with the law. I never liked giving mood-altering drugs. For her, I did it. (laughs) She couldn't make it alone. That was clear. People that, for one reason or another, just They trusted me, and I trusted them. There were many a patient encounter when I would reflect afterwards that, hmm, I think I got more out of that meeting than they did. How about that? I never called anybody up and said, hey, I want to thank you for coming in today. You made my life fuller or richer. I'd like to believe I could say that. I don't think I ever did, Tony. The one that always comes to mind is that young girl. I still think about her today, 25, 30 years later. Very beautiful young girl, just angelic. Radiance about her, uh, very open, uh, just, I don't know, something cherubic about her. And uh, her husband, who was very attached to her. and When she died, I was away. I was on vacation, and a specialist took care of her uh, when she died. I always wished that I were strong enough to have been there and helped her through that. I, I, I blame myself a lot for the feelings I had of relief that she died when I wasn't there. I'd like to have that over again, you know? Uh, But I've never forgotten that moment. Uh, 
And I always thought that's something I should have handled in a different way. I shouldn't have run away from that. When you hold back because you can't control the situation, you deny yourself the chance to learn the right way to do it for people. And medical school does not give you instructions like that. You just have to start getting out there and being vulnerable and let it happen and then you learn. You can't really learn about people from textbooks. Don't be afraid to get to know the person. And if you want to be helpful to them and brighten your own life, pay attention to the person even more than the disease. I think the most good I ever did for other people was helping them understand the circumstances of their life. The disease is it's not who they are. To remind them that they mattered. <laughs> Jim Kahn, MD, was today's morning story. My brother, the doctor. And here in the uh, listening room, Luke Gary Mott. Sounds like he's had a rewarding career. Often we would be living together in the same city, he would say, while he was in medical school, for instance, or as a resident or an intern in a hospital, come on over, spend the night with me. And I would have a chance to see what it was like to be a doctor at that particular point in his career. So thanks to him, I've seen people at their best and at their worst. He's just been a great older brother. He, he continues to be. Now he's leading the way into retirement. <laughs> <laughs> I have a, a younger brother who I'm very close to, very close. Have you learned something from your younger brother about what it is to be a younger brother? I think he looks up to me from the standpoint of my stability, the choices I've made in my life and career. He looks to those as really something to emulate. One of the things that I know that I can do for my older brother, I could tell him when he had his mind made up, even when he didn't know it. Hmm. You know, difficult choices that he might have to make, like where he was going to go to medical school, whether he was going to change careers. I would be able to say, you know, Jim, you already have your mind made up to do this. And he'd say, you think so? And I'd say, <laughs> well, yeah, I'm pretty sure, aren't you? I'd say, yeah, maybe you're right. You know, this is a reminder, Tony. Your brother mm -hmm. and my uncle... Yes, right. ...you know, uh, right. worked together back in the, I don't know, 50s right. uh, in Brazil. So you and I are forever tied by that uh, link. Yeah, it's yeah. a, it's a nice mean, reminder when I sit here with you what a small world it is and how, and how many different worlds we can live in also at the same time. I'm old enough to be your father, and yet I'm a younger brother... You're younger than I am, but you're an older brother. There are so many different ways in which we've seen life from very close, but maybe opposite sides. It's, it's all great fodder for the podcast over the years. And apparently some people agree. We got some email, and in fact, some of it very close to home. Well, not geographically. Kate lives in Italy. She's married to a, a man from Florence, a Florentine or Florentinian. Uh, Florentian. <laughs> Florentian. <laughs> Forgive us, Kate. I'm sure you'll tell us what the proper term is. But close to home in the sense that um, she's one of the transcribers of that incredible group of people who've made all of our uh, podcasts in our archive available. Kate writes, uh, during a recent flight over the Atlantic towards the United States, I was listening to a morning story. In fact... I was transcribing it at 35,000 feet. <laughs> at a certain beautiful point in the story, I paused and shifted my eyes from my laptop screen and looked around the darkened cabin. I wanted others to share in the joy I was feeling then. I thought, I wonder if anyone else is listening to a morning story up here. Most people were disconnected with each other and just fixed to the mini screens embedded in the seat in front of them, letting the stream of pretty poor popular entertainment numb them from thinking about the long flight. I wanted to get up and ask if I could plug my saved Morning Stories episodes into the in-flight audio options, thinking how pleasant the long flight would be if passengers were listening to, or now reading, Morning Stories. 
People would turn to each other, share their thoughts about the stories, exchange their own. For me, the image is sort of a surreal one, but one of hope. A group of perfect strangers in a swiftly moving cabin high in the sky. That common space where there are no borders. In tune with both the world's many special voices and with each other. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Kate. And thanks for all the transcribing. Those transcribers, I just can't say it often enough, are amazing. You know, I've been reading through some of those transcripts, and it reminds me that we've we've had 160 episodes of Morning Stories so far. We're into our fourth year. My gosh. What a trip we've been on these last four years, huh? Definitely. I'd love to hear from people who may have been there from the start. Let us know what these last four years have uh, been like. For you. You know how to do that. Morning stories at WGBH.org and a website, of course, WGBH.org slash morning stories. We'll be back with another morning story real soon. Take care.